What is happening, YouTube? This is Dave Croft. Welcome to my week 10 vlog check-in. Uh, this is where every week I take a look at the queue that I finished up in the previous week, talk about my week as a music production composer, and uh, today's probably going to be a little rambly. Uh, if you want to skip ahead to, uh, to the queue that I'm going to be talking about today, which is called Sunshine and a Picnic, that we wrapped up last week in our patron live stream. This is a cue that we wrote during the patron live stream. If you want to skip ahead to the the breakdown of this cue, check out the timestamps below in the description so you can get over you can skip over the, the rambling vlog bit. But if you want to kind of uh, hear about my world or my week as a production music composer, feel free to stick around. Now before we get into it, hey, I do appreciate the subscribes and the likes, and, and I, I don't actually say that ironically anymore, because I know how, uh, you know, it feeds the algorithm, and it helps other composers just like you find this video. So if you're finding the video helpful, and uh, you want to help spread the, the, the love, then hit that like, hit that subscribe, and all of that good googly YouTube business. Uh, we're about to hit 700 subscribers, and uh, 700 composers, 700 people interested in production music, and I love all of my prescribe, uh, my, all of my subscribers and all of the folks helping me out over on Patreon. Thank you so, so very much. I really, really appreciate it. And welcome. If this is your first time, hi. And if you've not subscribed and don't want to subscribe, that's cool too. You're welcome to stick around. So we're going to be talking about the queue, Sunshine and a Picnic here in a minute. But I wanted to talk about my week. And one of the things that I that really struck me this week is, is how everything's kind of starting to feel like it's a return to normal, right? Like I even, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about how I haven't had the beard trim. And I even got my beard trimmed. Jordan over at Atomic Barber, yes, I, I went jumped on my bike and went and got a beard trim. And it was uh, everything I, I hoped it would be. And uh, yeah, it's just, oh, it's so much. I looked at last week's video and I looked like a sea captain or something, but uh, but very happy to have a beard trim and uh, wrapped up a theater show that I've been playing for the last couple of weeks, playing Sister Act. And I am a drummer and a musician and I really, really enjoy theater music. And that that kind of gets me to the topic that I wanted to talk about today, which is when it's okay to turn down work, when it's okay to say no to things that you really, really enjoy and why that might be. And just talk about kind of my story a little bit. Like I said, I'm a theater musician. I started out uh, one of my earliest gigs. As a matter of fact, I think my first ever paying gig was theater music. As a drummer and a percussionist, especially one who could read music, who kind of knew how to play dynamically, and and you know, I was a timpani kid all, all throughout high school and into college. That was kind of my jam. I did drum set and jazz drums. D never was like into like big rock bands and that kind of thing. I, I was definitely a, a, a theater nerd, theater kid, pit musician, and that, that has carried me all the way through High school, I guess, would be my first paying theater gig up until last night we closed Sister Act uh, in, in, in Central Florida at the Wayne Dench Performing Arts Center in Sanford. And it was a great show. But within the last few years, I've noticed that I've had to start saying no. And I made a conscious choice to say no to more theater work. Because it used to be that I would I would just say yes to everything, everybody. Music director was in town, whatever they're putting on a show. I would I would you know chat them or send them an email or or if I had a, a, a personal connection, I would text them. I'd say, hey, I noticed that you're doing this show. Do you have a drummer yet? And so I would consciously and actively promote myself, and I got a ton of work that way, and I enjoyed it. Well, I enjoyed it for a while. A few years ago, as the trajectory of my production music life got busier and busier, and more, more requests from libraries who are getting me work, and as that started increasing, 
I was I was headed towards a collision of of building up contacts in Florida, building up you know directors and music director relationships, building that towards these cues. And I remember I was sitting in the pit, and I forget what show it was. It might have been a gentleman gentleman's guide to love and murder. I think might have been it. But I was sitting in 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 the pit, and I had the conscious thought. I really need to be in my studio right now. Not not quite in a this is a waste of time kind of way, but I I really need to be in my studio right now because I should be writing. My time is better spent right now writing. Because I essentially at that point had a full-time job teaching at Full Sail, which I love, and I'm not going to leave. And my music composition stuff, my production music, was and is approaching full-time level commitment. If not quite full-time, definitely three-quarter time. And that year, I think I did four or five shows, which I know by, by professional musician standards is not a ton. But with each, with each show taking at least three weeks, sometimes four weeks with rehearsals and tech and, and the, the run itself. That's a, that's a big chunk. So that's, that's, that's four or five months, you know, out of the year where I'm playing every night or most nights, definitely the weekends. And so there was this, this convergence my full-time job, my three-quarter times job, and then I had this other thing, this other, this other musician thing that I really enjoyed, but I had the realization that because I had been saying yes to everybody, that it had stopped being life-filling, soul-filling. And if anything, it had started becoming soul-draining. And I had that thought, I, I, I'm not where I need to be. It might not have been Gentleman's Guide. I can't remember what, what show it was. But I was like, I, I don't need to be here anymore. It's not only taking me away from the studio where I could be, if I'm being honest, be making more money. But I'm not really enjoying myself because I'm doing too much of it. And it's starting to kind of eat away at me. That's when I knew. And I made a conscious choice after that show. To A, not say yes to everything that came across my plate. And B, scale back my involvement with only the people, the music directors, the production companies, whatever, that I really, really enjoyed working for. Because theater music doesn't, doesn't pay a ton. It pays a little bit. And different production companies, you know, pay out differently. But it's basically... I, I work with one primary music director here in town. I work with a jazz duo, jazz singing duo. And I will always obviously say yes to my wife, who's also a music director. And uh, she, she, if she ever does a production again, then I'll, I'll, I'll be her pit drummer, absolutely. And she's music director and creative director at our church. And so, you know, I do the Sunday morning thing. But I'm not actively looking for work. I'm not emailing everybody I know about whatever show. And, and yeah. And that was, that was honestly a pretty difficult decision to come to because since high school, I have been saying yes to every single performing opportunity that came across. Even once I, even once I, 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 weren't, I wasn't right for, I auditioned for a, a, a drum a drum position at Legoland and got the part and then found out after, after I got and passed the audition, all of the dancing that was involved. (laughs) Oh yeah. Yep. And, uh, cause it was like a stomp kind of thing. And so after all the dancing, I was like, Ooh, you know what? This isn't for me. I am, I am not right 
for this gig. In fact, that was, I think that was around the same time. Funny story on that. The very next morning after I called the music director and I just said, you know what? I, I, I thank you for choosing me, but I, I don't think I have the, the gas in the tank to pull this off. And so I just, I said, let's give it to somebody who, who it's, it is what they want to be doing. Because if, if, if it's not soul-filling and, and instead it's soul-draining, then I am staying, standing in the, in the way of someone who it would be soul-filling for them. So absolutely. The very next day, after I had that phone call with the music director, and he was mega cool about it and like way thanked me for being honest and all of that. At least that's what he said. Maybe he cussed me when he hung up. But the next morning, I was changing the cat litter and threw out my back <laughs> like the old geezer that I am. I definitely am earning my, the white in my beard. Threw out my back, and I realized I... Because I, I would have thrown out my back regardless of if I hadn't turned down the Legoland gig. I would have thrown out my back. That means I would have had to go like try to do dance numbers. With a with a thrown out geezer back, so that's it's the moral of the story is it's okay to turn down work. It's okay to say no to things if if it's not soul filling, if it's not fulfilling you, and if it's getting in the way of of what you're really here to do. What you're really here to do, not to get like too like spiritual or whatever, but, you know, what are you here on the planet to do? I told you that every, every year I, I kind of take a, a word or a phrase and, uh, and kind of embrace that for the year. Last year, I talked about Dory, just keep writing. Well, this year, my, my phrase is center, or my word is center. Like, keep the thing that I am here to do, keep it in the center, and admittedly, I've, I've not been the best about that. You know, I've let some distractions get, get me off task, but I'm, I'm always pulling myself, tr- trying to pull myself back to center. And I, I love that, that I, I did this gig. I'm going to do another gig in a couple of weeks with the same music director because I love the people and I love him. And it's life filling. It's not life draining. But, this past, these past couple of weeks has reminded me what I'm really here to do, and it's not to be a theater musician. That's starting to move into hobby territory for me, which I'm like just now realizing that that's, wow, that's, that's kind of a realization. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. That's hard to say. That's hard to say, man. Something that has been a professional part of my life for so long has really been relegated to hobby territory. Hmm. That feels weird. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to sit with that for a while. Yeah. I'm gonna take a sip of coffee here. All right, so that uh, crashing sound you're hearing is my uh, my mental self image about uh, everything that I've been since high school, the theater kid and all of that, and uh, yeah, just realizing that that that's probably a uh, a very closed chapter as far as professionally. And I don't have any misgiving. I don't want to be a professional drummer. Like I, that's not what I want to do as a career. I want to be a composer. I want to be. I want to make music. And that's what, uh, that's what I'm really here to do. That's the center. That's the through line. That's the, uh, the dragon heart's string that is the wand of my life. And so with that, let's talk about this week's cue called Sunshine and a Picnic. But if you're still, if you're still listening, thank you for hanging around uh, while uh, I just uh, have my little uh, moment of therapy just live in front of you guys here on YouTube. <laughs> Let's uh, let's take a listen to Sunshine and a Picnic, and I'm going to break it down for you on the other side.
So, like I said, that was Sunshine and a Picnic. This is a cue that we put together during uh, a music production live stream that I do every Thursday. And then we wrapped up the mix on Monday, and I live streamed that as well. So, Sunshine and a Picnic, this, I, I am moving on from Americana Attention Cues, and now I am doing an album of Happy Clappy. That was, I don't, I don't think that's the official genre. I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure Happy Clappy is, is a genre, but that's what I'm, I'm calling it. It's a childlike innocence. And uh, and so it's going to feature a lot of ukulele. The cue that I uh, started last week uh, has an African high life kind of vibe to it. So my, I busted out the banjo lele and so did some finger picking stuff with that. So that, that was a lot of fun. And uh, you, you guys might hear about that next week. But uh, it f prominently features a uh, ukulele, which I have double tracked, meaning I have one track on the left side, one track on the right side. And I do this for a couple of reasons. The first thing is, is it really widens out the stereo field. And uh, I, certain instruments, uh, very uh, transient instruments, I think this works really, really well for. So I will double track sh like shakers, percussion, uh, ukulele tends to do really, really well. S finger picked instruments do really, really well double track. So I have a, a left and, and a right. So the first reason I do this is to get a really nice wide stereo image. The other is, is that I find that it brings like an organic quality. It's like it's not perfect on either side. And if I'm being honest, if I'm being honest, it helps to cover up and hide any rhythmic inconsistencies. And it feels really organic and alive. And it uh, doesn't feel overly quantized and all of that. Now, that having been said, did I, did I quantize this? Yes, I actually will go in and run a quantization pass through it but I won't like make it really, really precise. So you'll see here, I'm at like 83% and 72%. Definitely do not, uh, do not overly quantize it. Otherwise it squashes it. it makes them too perfect. And then you actually get into like, you can get into phasing issues and that kind of thing. All right, so uh, I'm not a ukulele, I'm not a professional ukulele player. And uh, that was like an $80 ukulele that I got on Amazon. By the way, if there's one instrument that, that I think that every production music composer should own, it should be a stinking ukulele because they're, they're really easy to play. They're really easy. The, uh, it's only four strings. You hold down one note, you know, you play a ukulele. And, and you hold down one note, you can get a C. And, uh, and so it's, yeah, the chords are really easy, especially in first position. I'm not saying... I'm not saying ukulele, ukulele can be a challenge to play, especially if you get into extended chords. And uh, like I, I, as, a, as a person with a jazz background, I really enjoy the, um, the extended jazz chords and that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm getting a little bit into that, but it's definitely, I'm not a guitarist nor a ukulele player. But uh, that's just a little cheap ukulele. And so I, I, I was really, really happy with, with the results on that. The other thing, that that uh, these cues are going to have in common. So bouncy ukulele, uh, innocence. So it's all like in a major key, and Glockenspiel. And so I am using Sonic Couture's Glockenspiel, and uh, this was something that I didn't know I wanted in my life. Uh, because I got an email and they were like, hey, new, uh, I don't know if it's a new library or not, but uh, hey, there's, this is on sale. And I was like, I don't, I don't need, I don't need a Glockenspiel, uh, a Glockenspiel library, but let me take a listen to it and see. And then I thought, ooh, I saw that it had rubber mallets. And then I saw that it had plastic mallets and brass mallets. And the uh, percussionist in me, I, I got I, it really turned me on as a percussionist because I'm like I don't have a, a, a library that has different mallet types. Usually it's 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 this is it this is your Glock you will like it. But to have rubber and plastic and brass 
articulations, not just across the glockenspiel, but also the the um, Kratales, and they have the same library. It comes with glockenspiel, Kratales, and tubular bells, aka orchestral chimes, and they have rawhide, rubber, and plastic mallets for that. And I have never seen that. I'm not saying it's not out there, but I have not seen a library that gave me the option to use like rawhide mallets. That took me back to freaking middle school band with that look dog chew toy looking thing in the big percussion box. You, any of you percussionists out there, you're feeling me, right? <laughs> middle school band, that, that dog chew toy that we would use every Christmas playing the Christmas concert, bing bong, bing bong. So to be able to have like an option for rubber mallets, which, uh, which I'm using, whoops. And then the plastic mallets. Oops, <laughs> let, me, let me get this here. Sorry, I got the wrong window pulled up. And so you can see they're doubled and they just give it, they give a different timbre and I blended them together. And so I was really, really excited. And the fact that it was on sale and the Sonic Couture stuff, it's like a little boutique stuff. I really, really enjoy those guys and what they, what they're doing over there. And then bring on this Celeste doubling and then a piano in the harmonies and then and when we get to the, the end, then I have my whistling. And those need to be colored appropriately. Let's, uh, let's color those whistles. And this is just me whistling into a microphone. There is absolutely nothing special about my whistling skills. And we, when we were doing this live, you know, before I, I cleaned it up, it's really embarrassing because you hear all the mouth noises and the gross breathing that happens from, you know, slee stack. But it it it, uh, it 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 stacks up really nicely and I have them panned. So I have two to the left, two to the right, and and yeah, added that in and this is my kind of my John Debney uh, elf moment. <laughs> Using Vienna Symphonic Library here. They're my go-to woodwinds. Really, really nice. One of the challenges of the Vienna Symphonic Library, though, is, is that these instruments respond not only to velocities, but also to the expression parameter. And so you could play something. Let's see. Uh, not, not hearing anything, but that's all right. So I, I get velocities but I can also use the mod wheel. And so that, 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 can, be, that can be a challenge. And uh, one of the things that, that, that I really only see in Vienna, in the libraries that I have, because usually it's either velocity or mod slash expression wheel. It's, 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 it's rare to see both of them. Now I've seen mod and expression kind of do, do similar type of things, but to see, like uh, the the velocity will give you the art, the articulation, the expression will give you kind of what you do with that, and the expression also will affect the timbre, right? And so the, so that could be that could be a real challenge, and it, it involves a lot of tweaking where you have to go in and say, okay, this note is 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 the right velocity, but the expression isn't right, or the expression of this note is right, but the velocity it feels like it's kind of too overblown, and so. It's the modulation, but I've gone in and mapped the modulation, the expression to the mod wheel. That's what's going on there. So those are all my melodic instruments on top of the ukulele, the piano, a couple of different piano layers. And so we have one just playing chords, nothing fancy at all. One of the things that you have to be really careful when you're splitting a piano part like this is that we can't we can't have a, an eight-armed pianist.
All right, so I'm always really con- conscious of of making sure that that like it's not like somebody down here. I don't want two pianists on this gig. I just I just need one pianist. So I try to make even if I can't physically play it, I try to make it feel like it's playable by uh, a human being. Now I have some vibraphone, just uh, just chords. Actually, those are just octaves. And also supporting uh, the harmony. Just some marimba rolls that are not quantized. Okay, otherwise it's gonna sound too mechanical. The electric bass, and this is just stock logic uh, vibraphone, stock logic marimba. The electric bass is the scarby bass, uh, specifically the neck position, so it's a little, little softer, not quite as plucky. And then some claps that we recorded. Start with two layers, and then in the second half, and then a suspended cymbal that I recorded. And so the form is intro, melody, and then into this kind of this little bridge, and then return to the main melody and then to the bridge. So it's a, it's a basic A, B, A, B form. That's what's going on with this form. Because it's very sing-songy and the melody is so prominent, unlike tension cues where you can kind of build, 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 pull back, build, 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 this is going to follow much more of a song structure, your typical verse chorus type of a song structure. In this case, this is kind of uh, uh, verse bridge or chorus bridge, chorus bridge, or A, B, A, B. Uh, kind of kind of a form. And so I imagine most of these ukulele type cues and which have really strong little singable melodies, they're going to probably feel more like a song structure than your typical production music form that that I use with with hip hop cues and with tension cues, action cues and trailer cues. Those are going to have those typical type of builds. These are going to fit much more into a a a song type of a form. So that is Sunshine and a Picnic, and I really pr- appreciate you hanging out with me today, whether it's Monday morning that you're watching this or any time of the day. Also, I appreciate all of my new subscribers. We are approaching uh, 700 subscribers. Thank you, guys. And if you're joining me for the first time, thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking forward. We're, man, we are marching towards 1,000 subscribers. Uh, I do have a Monday mix down for my Patreon patrons this afternoon. I will be mixing down the uh, African High Life cue that we wrote last week. Uh, if that's something that's interesting to you, seeing the uh, the production music process, then you can check out uh, the Patreon. Uh, memberships are just a dollar, and I do live streams every single week. So I hope you have an amazing, amazing week 11, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, peace. <laughs>